Yes. Welcome, everybody. Hope everyone is well. Um, what's up, Dave? Yeah, what's happening? Uh, we're on uh, John's link, so let me find John and um, let's see if he can uh, make me a co-host as well. Um, let's see. Hope everybody is well. Thanks for tuning in. What's up, Cameron? What's up, Luann? And what's up, Dad? My dad's on the call. Super cool. What's up, Mom? What's up, Dad? How's it going? We had about uh, we had about 400 people register, so we're gonna give it a week. I mean, a week. We're gonna give it a minute, <laughs> and uh, hopefully, people will hop on. Um, one of the first times where I'm not sure about the transition or conversion from people who register for people who ever come. So we're talking about giving stuff away. And I learned that from my dear mentor who's on the call right now. He said, give away stuff for free and it'll come back to you and through you for you and for the benefit of others. So just one of the many millions of lessons that I've learned from Dave Meltzer, the ferocious Buddha, which we'll get into in a, <laughs> a second. Um, Dave, do you see John on here at all? I didn't see John. I see your parents, though. So this is already worth it for me. Yes. <laughs> What's up? What's up, mom? If you uh, well, we wait for John, if you want to come on and give uh, five, 10, 15 seconds of a hello. Um, these are my parents, my mom and dad. Uh, do you guys know how to unmute yourself? <laughs> Mom, you there? Hi. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Hi. Okay. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here again Hi, with such great people. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good. Hey, Jackie. <laughs> Rick, everybody. Hi, great awesome. to be here with everybody tonight. Very excited. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't see John. Let's see. I can we, can get, we can get started anytime, man. Johnny can join us. Okay. Cool. I'll send a text right now. That's what happens when you're super famous. Yeah. <laughs> Late arrival. Is that time for us? <laughs> he has time. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. I'll give it another. Maybe we, we get to about 100. There he is. Ah, uh, there he is. Oh, wow. there he just had to put it out there that we didn't care about him. And then it, boom. David, He's like, hey, I want to. <laughs> Look, look, my, my team, we, we've been filming, oh, we've been, we, we got, my team's been here having some fun, filming some really cool stuff. Awesome. That's awesome. Right, awesome. Dude. Everybody put What's your up, mask John? back on. Awesome. Hi, everyone. What's up, everybody? Um, thank you, John. Thank you, David. Um, as we get going, I'm going to give a little intro here, and as more people trickle in, um, but uh, before I intro these legends that are on, I want to give, uh, I want to talk about, we're going to give some giveaways and I'm going to play some games in the chat. So if I say throw something in the chat, my girl, Amy Sorter, who is the ultimate lesson in persistence. Thank you, Dave and John for helping her. She's going to keep an eye on the chat. And the first person to write something, when we call for it, they're going to either win a book or maybe some cash or a coaching session or something. So on the books, I also learned this from Dave, we will pay for the shipping. You don't pay anything. All you got to do is DM us your address. We got inner size. We got game time decision making. We got connected to goodness. And we might give away some cash, might give away some coaching. But And there are people from all over the world, all over the world. We got United States, all over the place, Europe, Australia, even got Vietnam in there. So drop in the chat where you're from. And I bet you there's somebody on this call that can help somebody or help somebody or empower somebody or empower somebody else. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. And as I get into these, uh, these intros, so John Asaraf, my law of Goya brother. John Asaraf is one of the leading mindset and behavioral experts in the world who has appeared numerous times on Larry King Live, Anderson Cooper, and the Ellen DeGeneres Show. John has built five multi-million dollar companies, including taking one public on the NASDAQ and growing Remax of Indiana to 1,200 sales associates and 4.5 billion a year in sales. He has written a new best-selling book called Inner Size. If you want this book signed by John, write Inner Size in the chat. Inner Size, I-N-N-E-R-C-I-S. Amy, get the first person, we'll send them a book, we pay the shipping. He has written a new best-selling book called Inner Size, in addition to two New York Times best-selling books that has been translated in 35 languages. John has been featured on 10 movies, including the blockbuster bit hit The Secret, the reason why I have the vision board behind me, and Quest for Success with Richard Branson and the Dalai Lama. Today, he is the founder and CEO of MyNeuroGym.com, 
a company dedicated to using the most advanced technologies and evidence-based brain training methods to help individuals strengthen their mindset so they unleash their inner power and maximize their results. Okay. If anybody else wants a book from the person that I just read off, write gratitude in the chat. Amy, get the first person that writes gratitude in the chat. We'll get look at the chat fire up. I love it. Okay. Now, David, my ferocious Buddha brother, mentor, friend. Uh, David Meltzer is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing and formerly served as the CEO of the world-renowned Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. His life's mission is to empower over a billion people to be happy. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide one thing, value. That is what he's given to me. And in all of his content and communication, that's exactly what you will receive. As part of that mission for the past 20 years, he's providing wheat free weekly trainings to empower others, to empower others to be happy. I am one of David's people to be one of the inspires a thousand, to inspire a thousand, to get them to a billion. And lucky for us, we can all be one of those people. So it's super cool that my mom and dad have seen what you two have done for me in my life and that they're on the call. I love you, mom. Love you, dad. Love you, Sess. And um, I also, one mentor that you guys also know that's a huge mentor of mine, Tom Bilyeu, sometimes he will do an event and he'll stay for Q&A. On this call tonight, I will stay on for Q&A for anybody that wants to ask me a question as long as anybody stays on. I know John and Dave probably got to go, but I will Excuse me, Ricky. Sorry to interrupt, but there's people trying to get into the call and it says that there's a maximum of 100. Is there any way you can expand that? Um, John, we're on your link. <laughs> Is there any way to, to expand that or could you ask your team? On my, on my link? I don't, I, we have unlimited on ours. Um, I use the link that Summer uh, sent me if Summer or Andrea uh, is available. <laughs> uh, Andrea just walked out. Okay. Um, but let me do this. I'm going to just, while you talk, I'm going to just uh, mute myself and okay. I will find out. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. You're too popular, <laughs> man. You're too popular. <laughs> Adjustments, right? Adjustments. So yeah, we did have about 400 registers. So hopefully we can open that up. Um, if not, you guys are just going to have to do another one with me. So, um, so I will stay on for as long as people want for Q&A. Um, and what I want to start with is the most simple thing on the planet. And John, as you're figuring that out, I just want to share my gratitude poem that you gave me. And this was a massive piece of my life. And David, when the first time I interviewed you, I asked you what your favorite word was. And you said gratitude. And I handed you a gratitude poem. So we'll start with Dave. And can you give us just a, maybe, you know, we could spend an hour on this, but just maybe a minute or two on why gratitude is the most powerful force and how we can use it today to help people with the world the way it is right now. Well, gratitude is so powerful because it's perspective and it allows you to have control of the three things that you need control of. We can't find outside of us, no matter how much change there is or acceleration or growth, what we can't find inside of ourselves. And gratitude is that key that allows us not to have to run around over or through things. Just it's the key that allows us to live our lives in abundance. Why is that? Because it allows us to have and find the light, the love and the lessons in our mindset. Uh, in our heart set, the way we feel, and of course, what we think, say, do, and believe, and of course, affects our own personality traits, our own characteristics, our own obsessions and addictions. All of these aggregated together actually allow us to materialize what we want, and gratitude itself, I've been blessed. I you know, joke around, but the two things that I learned when I was three years old are the most uh, impressed upon and commented to me of how I've changed people live. And I laugh to my wife all the time. I'm like, can you believe I went through all that school? I've written all these books. I've done TVs and movies and sports, agents, all the things I've done. And yet I'm credited for changing people's lives because I told them to say thank you. Um, and I know I learned that when I was three. Some people even said I stole gratitude from Gary V, which I thought was really cool too. But uh, it's amazing because John is one of those people that will agree uh, because he has studied physics, quantum physics, and metaphysics. And I promise you, if you just say thank you before you go to bed and when you wake up every single day for 30 straight days, it'll change your life. The saddest thing is if I asked all of you, over 100 of you here today, if you could say thank you, 
when you went to bed and when you woke up for 30 straight days, all of you would raise your hand. It's so easy. It's 0.1 seconds. Of course I can do it. Uh, I've surrounded myself with great thought leaders like John Asroff, Jack Canfield, Deepak Chopra, all the list of the great ones in the world on Transformational Leadership Council and the movies, The Secret and Beyond the Secret or whatever else there is out there. Everyone agrees gratitude is the most powerful thing. But yet by tonight, even though I've told you this secret right at the beginning of this mastermind here, half of you won't say thank you. By the morning, another half of you won't say thank you. And within three days, almost all of us will forget to say thank you. It took me nine months myself till I could say thank you every single day without forgetting. And so I think that's the most important lesson is that every lesson you're going to learn, you're going to forget. But what is so powerful is we have the ability to access every lesson that we've learned and even ones that we haven't learned yet because pain itself is an indicator. It's not a stop sign. It's a turn signal to put us into better place, a better direction, because it indicates we have a lesson to learn. And that's what gratitude is to me, that perspective that life is about those lessons and that we will find the light, the love and the lessons in everything we do. And I love, we were just at Thrive Together and I love the light, the life, the life lessons in the suck. That was awesome. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, everyone's, everyone's life sucks the same. We just have to find the light, the love and the lessons in the suck. <laughs> I love it. And John, um, you know, I met you this year. One of my things I've been saying all year is one of the greatest parts about 2020 and why I believe it's the greatest time to be alive is relationship capital. You have made a massive impact on my life, literally why my vision board is behind me. And I was lucky enough to speak on stage in front of you and then share the digital stage. And you gave me something that I'm going to carry forever. And it was a gratitude coin. Can you share how you use this and what, how you've used gratitude in your life to create a more fulfilling in life of your goals and dreams? I was looking for mine. It was on my desk and uh, <laughs> it must have moved. So let, let's piggyback with um, you know, what David said. Uh, and we don't necessarily forget to do things because we want to. Um, the way that our brains work, and I always have my brain on my desk so I can look at it. Um, but we, we forget things because when we read something or we watch something or we listen, um, it activates our short-term memory and it may make us feel really good in the moment or we feel like we're learning, but short-term memory doesn't really change behavior long-term. It can change behavior in the immediate moment. It can change feelings in the immediate moment, but it doesn't translate to longer term consistent change in thoughts or emotions or behaviors. That's part one. Part two, when we're talking about gratitude, we know that when we think about and feel something that we are grateful for, so let's take waking up, let's take putting your feet you know, on the ground, let's take the ability that you can actually breathe right now without thinking about it, and the hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are being used in your body to grow nails, to grow hair, to digest food, to make muscles, uh, and to give you life. It's like a freaking wow, right? It's a miracle every second that you're alive and your DNA is not unraveling. That's a wow second. So when we remember what we're grateful for, we actually activate the reward center in our brain. We have circuits in our brain, right? We have networks and circuits that turn on or off. When we say something and feel something we're grateful for, we just activated and reinforced a positive reward circuit in our brain that when we do this, morning, noon, night, maybe every hour, like I've got a bell, my, my cell phone goes off at 55 minutes after every hour. You know why? To remind me to recalibrate my brain circuitry, to remind myself to be grateful for the last 55 minutes, to focus on what I'm going to be doing so that I can be grateful for in the next hour. And as we take some time to be mindful and to be in a state of gratitude, we can find so many things to be grateful for. Even in the, in the term you said before, you've got to embrace or love the suck. That's a Navy SEAL term. They <laughs> teach you to embrace the suck. 
because it's in the suck that you build your neuro muscles, your physical muscles, your spiritual muscle, your awareness and your, your skill to be able to do more. You expand yourself when you appreciate and are grateful for the suck because it's not in the great times that we learn the most. It's when we overcome the most challenging times and the most challenging of our lessons that we survive, that we go, look what I have become because of that. Uh -huh. So, um, so there's a reason there's a neurological and biological reason that this works to be grateful. The other thing that people don't recognize is as soon as I set up, you know, what I'm grateful for, I actually just change the lens by which my brain is operating from, right? So if I give my brain something to focus on that I'm grateful for, and we train our brain to be grateful for things, then our brain actually seeks more things to be grateful for. And it seeks to release that dopamine, the feel good neurochemical, which causes us what? It causes us to be happy. It causes us to, to connect with other people, which releases serotonin. It causes us to share what we're grateful with others, which releases oxytocin, more feel good neurochemicals. And guess what that's connected to? It's actually connected to your motivational center. And that's connected to your motor cortex, which means you're gonna act in ways that are more consistent with creating more things to be grateful for. So as much as people like to talk about gratitude as a, it's, it's a good thing to do, I like to understand what's going on in there. Like what's happening in my brain that's actually gonna help me achieve the success that I want faster and easier than ever before. And what's gonna help me move away from what I don't want. And so gratitude is just a great, easy, it's, it, it, it's, it doesn't cost you a, a, a nano penny. And so, Mm -hmm. I created these gratitude coins um, um, that I give to special people in the world. And I gave one to Ricky because he did such a great job on stage, making a difference in people's lives. And it says, you know, the universe provides abundance to those who are grateful. Um, and um, so that's, that's that gratitude coin story. I love it. Thank you. And I, I, you guys both have made me obsessed with the brain. Tom as well. If you want connected to goodness, write goodness in the chat. <laughs> Amy, see who wants goodness in the chat. You got to be quick. We'll send it. We pay the shipping and everything. Um, there's two things also that I really want to dive into. And one, like, John, I met you years ago. And I remember where I was when I watched The Secret. I remember who was around me. I remember what was said. And The Secret sometimes, like Dave says, you can't just sit there high on your mom's couch and get what you want. So the, the secret for me opened up a door of research. It opened up a door of awareness, even though it was a, a 50,000 foot view. So can you guys talk to me and we'll start with John and, and give me your take on two things. The law of Goya, share what that is because that absolutely changed my life. And then also when you go and you go through the law of Goya, usually if you can ask for help, that's gonna help you get to your goals and dreams faster, more efficiently through impact than ever before. So those two things, kind of asking uh, or talking about the law of Goya and then asking for help. So I assume everybody knows or has heard about the law of attraction, right? Everybody, just show of hands, yeah? Yeah. So a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding of the law of attraction. And I think there was, um, uh, there were a few things in the movie that I just didn't agree with. And most people don't know this, but most of the people in the movie, you know, came into a hotel room. We sat on a chair. There was a green screen behind us. We were asked a bunch of questions for an hour and then we left. We had no idea what it would look like. We had no idea if we would make it into the movie or not. We just answered questions about the law of attraction. My piece happened to make it into the movie and you know, it was seen by half a million people. But the law of attraction, as most people metaphysically like to talk about it, is you know, get in the right vibration and the universe will like bring to your door a big basket of money and a new car and a new bicycle and that beautiful husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend. And uh, just like magic, it's gonna happen. So I wanna share with you, I've achieved a few things in my life and just pay close attention to what I'm about to share with you. That's, I won't swear, but if I was, it would be that's freaking bullshit. That's okay, you can hear, it's cool with me. I, no I'm good to. with it. <laughs> no need to. So if, if we wanna understand the law of attraction, the last six letters of attraction are action. 
So if you apply the law of attraction with what I term is the law of Goya, the get off your ass law and do the right things in the right order at the right time, then you can have predictable transformation and success. So I fully understand that there is the physical laws of nature. So my body right now is a molecular structure, 100 trillion cells coalesced into the sentient being that we call John Asraf, that's my name. But if you were to look at my hand through an electron microscope, all you'd see is vibrating packets of energy called quanta. There's actually more space to me than there is particle. Let's leave that aside for just a moment. And let's think about um, music, right? If you think about music and a radio, if you turn your radio to uh, your favorite channel right now, uh, your favorite channel might be for rock and roll or classical music or punk rock or jazz or new age, whatever it is. So when you tune your, your radio, your receiver, okay, to the station that you love, what happens to all the other stations that are in the room that you're in right now or in the car that you're driving? Like what happens to all those? And the answer is they're still there, but you're not tuned into them. You're on, let's say 95.5 is the station you love. At 95.6 is a polar opposite sound that's coming through your TV or radio or cell phone. Everybody agree with me on that? So is it possible that since my body, okay, is a molecular structure, is it possible that if I get my brain to be in concert, in coherence with my emotions, with my gut, then I can get this molecular structure to be in vibration, oscillation with what it is that I want, part one. Is that possible that we can do that? Yes or yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then part two, would you agree that on this planet, I don't know about other planets, but on this planet, if you want to make more money, for example, there are laws to making money. There's laws of compensation, right? Because money is nothing more than a means of exchange. So if we can get our mind, our heart, our gut, and our bodies into action, doing the right things, so that we provide our products, services, knowledge, or skills to other people who want it, they will exchange money with us because we live in a monetary society. Is it possible that that's how money works? Yes yeah. or yes? Now, while we are doing those right things, is it possible that stuff happens because we're in resonance, okay, with doing the right things with the right people at the right time, and all of a sudden things happen where, oh my God, stuff lands on our lap because we are in resonance, in harmony, in coherence with the tools, the people, the resources that we want. Now, let's talk about using the exact same principles for your health, okay? First and foremost, are we molecular structures? Yes. Do we have nine systems that our body works um, uh, synergistically in order to take food in, create muscles, tissues, bones, organs, etc. Yes. If we put the right energy in, does it give us the right energy out? Yes. Can we get from a state of dis-ease into a state of at-ease? Yes. These are all known scientific methods to be healthy, happy, wealthy, etc. when we are in concert, in harmony, in coherence. The law of attraction and vibration is all about getting spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical aligned in coherence with whatever result you want. If any one of those things are out of place, it's no different than having four numbers to open up a safe, but one number is wrong. Mm -hmm. You ain't opening up the safe until you get the alignment. It ain't going to happen. Sorry for using English that way, but it's just not <laughs> going to happen. So is it possible that everything that you and I want, it's already here, but if we're not in harmony, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically doing the right things, we're just, it's just not gonna happen for us. Why? Well, we live in a universe of orderly perfection. 
Nature does what she does maximally efficiently on time every time, no exceptions. The complexity of what we're dealing with that our brain is interpreting and helping us create is so unbelievably complex that we have to sometimes slow down to pick up speed and to get ourselves into coherence and alignment to realize that there's a multitude of things happening at the same time. And we focus on the critical few versus the trivial many that we get into coherence. I'll give you one last example, Ricky, and then you can, you can take it from there. Imagine you have, uh, um, you, you are the conductor of an orchestra or your favorite band. There's five to 10 musicians and three of the musicians are not in harmony. What does the music sound like? There are 10 amazing uh, musicians. What does the music sound like? What does your band sound like if two or three of the band members are out of harmony? Does it sound great? Like, do you pay money to go see no, oh, it's terrible. They're seen. not in harmony or coherence. So what do musicians do? They practice to get in harmony and coherence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's when, when people get frustrated, it's something that, like Dave says, cancel, clear, connect, and back into that vibration or tune or energy or whatever we can do, which we have control over. And I, um, I'll take a second... Um, we're going to send this recording out, so we do apologize if people weren't. And we did upgrade. We did upgrade this specific account, just so you know, on the fly. I got awesome. look here. Here's the text. Upgraded. <laughs> I love it. Adjustments on and the Dave, fly. Adjustment. I love it. Hey, it's what we're all about in 2020. Um, and David, like when we start to look at the law of Goya, we actually start to take action. We can force that action. The best thing that you have taught me, and I preach this to every single day to every single one of my teams, three words that can change your life, ask for help. Because people think it comes from weakness, so they don't. And then two things happen, they don't get help, and you pretty much deprive somebody of somebody who'd be willing to help you. you that was such one of the most valuable lessons that you've taught me. Can you tell people why asking for help comes from strength and why we want to ask for help in our life and business? Yeah, I think it comes and stems from the understanding of a totality. Uh, what, what happens is when we believe in the law of attraction, then therefore, if I give, therefore, I will receive. And that became truly an interference in what I wanted, because what I started to learn was that I had no problem giving. I was born a giver. It was quantum in my nature. It was handed down not only from four generations, but maybe from the universe itself as an inception of everybody's fingerprint to give to, that is a recognition, a recollection and a remembrance that we're all connected by giving. Where the difficulty for me was in receiving, and as I coach so many people today, most people don't feel worthy. And most people are afraid to receive. They don't feel good about receiving. And the reason is, is they don't have faith. They don't have faith in the totality. And they also don't have faith that they don't know the totality. And therefore, they make judgments, conditions, and limitations that separate us from the totality that John was talking about, the everything for everyone. So when I shifted the paradigm from I am no longer going to give to receive. It is not a trade. It's not a negotiation. I don't live in a scarce world of fear. I have full faith in one thing that I am always connected to the greatest source of light, love, and lessons in everything abundance. I live my life between limitlessness and infinity. And what I'm going to only focus in on is how much can I receive so that it can come through me with appreciation not just gratitude, but my ability to add value to what I've received and give it away without any interference. And what happens is we use the ego, right? The employment status that we have, what we get in our life, the G or what other people think to interfere or corrode the connection to what we're all connected to, which is everything, which is why it's so important to be in harmony or frequency with what you want, because there's a huge bank that's just waiting to give it to you. But most people are afraid to ask for it. And in fact, you know, I have two words on my nightstand. It's not thank you. It is radical humility. And if I'm going to teach someone a question, my three-year-old, my four-year-old, my five-year-old, it wouldn't matter. It is simply what I learned at three. Do you know anyone that could help me, right? What were the two things we learned at three? Say thank you and ask. People don't ask. 
And if you don't believe it's important to ask, think about when we were young, John and I at least, you know, our parents, grandparents, and friends, they knew two or three people. They had their card games, their Maj game, they had the golf game, you know, they had the church or, or temple group, and you needed a job, and you say, Dad, I need some help. Let me ask Uncle Steve. He might know somebody. Are you kidding me today? 4.4 billion people are connected to it. My 10-year-old has 10,000 followers. If you're not asking for help in person, on the phone, via email, and media, radio, print, TV, and social media, do you know anyone that helped me? And just as I finish up, because I want to listen to John, um, <laughs> my, my, fa my favorite thing to think of it as we do it is that question, right? That question allows us do you know, it stops us from what stops us from receiving. Most people see things as mountains. Most people see gatekeepers to those mountains. If you have faith that you are unlimited, that you don't live in a world of not enough where things happen to you as a victim and you're a why me person, or like me, when I became rich at a young age, I lived in what a world I called just enough. I bought things I didn't need. If I wasn't happy, I bought more things I didn't need, different things I didn't need. If I wasn't happy, I bought things to impress people. If I was really unhappy, I'd buy things to impress people I didn't like. Everything was happening for me. I was giving to receive, but now I trust I don't look at the mountains or the gatekeeper. I look at what made the mountains and made the gatekeeper because those gatekeepers to me are sponsors. Everyone, a tree has no branches. Everyone is my sponsor. I no longer have an illusion if I look at John and say, oh, he's not gonna answer my phone call. He thinks he's better than me. I'm not as good as him. I can't ask him for a favor. I see John and I say to myself, man, there's somebody that wants to help me. And if he can help me himself, he'll be a power sponsor and he knows other people. You need to ask, do you know anyone that can help me? You'll be amazed how good you make everyone else feel, how connected you feel, not only to the other person, but to the greatest source of light, love, and lessons. It is the absolute proof. The easiest way to get what you want is simply find someone where that's where you want to be and ask them for directions. And the only way you ask him the directions is, do you know anyone that can help me get there? I love that. So as you see, we're starting to shape this. Our brains are the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably powerful for us the world has ever known. We have to get off our ass. We want to ask for help. And then as we start to do that, what I discovered is persistence. Is persistence over a long enough timeline, we win. But then people want to get rich in two minutes and then they quit because our ego gets in the way. So as we kind of block this as we go one thing if you want a book from dave game time decision write game time in the chat game time in the chat amy watch it i love when the chat goes like that all right let's switch it up who wants another inner size book write inner size in the chat write inner size in the chat and you get an inner size book signed by john and amy keep track of inner size okay so as we go um into persistence so I love network marketing. I'm going to share this with people because there's people in Australia from Arbonne, Kim Leonard, a huge fan of you guys, Ali Hirschman from Monet, who lives in New York. Dave, we met because you gave free um, meetups, and now she's a huge fan of John. And a, a few of us on the call are in that business where we really need to stay persistent. And I think that's applicable to no matter what your life or business is. So John, as we start to look at the brain, have awareness, like you say, it gives us choice and that choice gives us freedom. How do you develop that persistent either mindset or muscle or to stay down the course of your potential? I mean, it's a loaded question. So, but, but let, let's think about um, this from maybe a different angle for just a moment. And I'll see if I can make a point. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have um, a family member or a pet that is uh, in need of some help. Maybe you need to raise money for surgery. Maybe um, you know this pet or family member you know needs you in a way that you nobody's ever needed you like that before. And if you didn't help them. Um, something would happen to them that would affect their lives negatively for the rest of their lives. Would you be persistent and do whatever you could to make sure that didn't happen? How many of you would be persistent beyond measure? So what that tells me and you is persistence is already in you. You just need to have a big enough reason why you must 
achieve the goal that you want. And then you activate persistence because it's already there. Now, again, I'm going to come back to the brain, right? When we don't have reasons why we must, then our brains make our stories and excuses and fears bigger. Let me repeat. When we don't have reasons why we must do something, achieve something, et cetera, our brains make our stories, reasons, excuses, and fears bigger. So when those are bigger, then we lose motive for action, right? Motivation is motive for action. So when we are setting goals and a vision for our lives, if you think about why must I achieve this? Like, why must I? Not why should I, why I'd like to, why it would be nice, but why must I? So I'll give you maybe a little example from my own life. Um, I've had several friends and family members that got into their 60s and 70s and 80s and were regretful. They were just regretful that they didn't go after their biggest goals and dreams. They didn't let go of their limiting beliefs soon enough. They didn't manage fear soon enough. They thought they weren't worthy or deserving enough for so long that they were in a state of regret. Part one of the story. Part two of the story. I am not religious at all, but I believe that there is a universal intelligence that gives me life. And so I have this visual in my mind that one day when I am no longer in physical form and I have, you know, another transition into wherever we go, whatever happens there, I have this visual in my mind that I'm going to meet God. And I have this visual in my mind and I don't believe in God as a deity, as some you know, man or woman up in, in the sky, uh, et cetera. I'm not religious at all. But I have this, this dialogue in my mind that if God said to me, hey, um, I put you on that earth with certain skills and fears and uncertainties and strengths and, and abilities, what did you do with that collage of gifts that I gave you? I can't fathom for a second, me going, um, I, 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 I didn't use it. I didn't push myself. I didn't, I, I, I can't, it makes me sick to even think about it as I'm talking with all of you right now. I can't fathom me saying to our creator, whatever that means to you, that I didn't use the gifts that I was given when I could have, that I didn't take the tools that were given to me to fix any problem that I had just about when I could have. I refuse to have that dialogue go that way. So I use the carrot of the life that I want of, of having, giving, becoming, expanding, sharing as something that moves me towards it and I also use what I want to move away from, okay, the stick part of never having to answer that to myself and to say to myself, you know, when I'm in my 70s or 80s or 90s or 100, you know, that I'm regretful that I didn't try this, do this, let go of this. I just can't, I cannot stand that thought. Right. So there's the answers to some of the questions, Ricky. I love it. I love it. And then we got about another 10 minutes because I want to leave John with 10 minutes um, to share his free, free event, the Brainathon. Um, Amy, if you can drop that link in the chat again. And let's play another little game. Um, put in goodness for another book from Dave. Good and goodness. Amy, catch that. Put in inner size from another one for John. And then that'll go get you another one. And now put in the word money. First one to get money. I'm going to Venmo you a hundred bucks tonight Whoa, Send me a wow. DM on Instagram. Ricky Mendez speaks. Also, Amy, throw your Instagram and whoever wrote that first, will give you a hundred bucks. Now I want to go towards mentorship because you guys have changed my life. <laughs> Hands down and unequivocally, I cannot express the gratitude that I have every single day for how you've changed the trajectory of my life, along with my mom, my dad, and my sister. But when you look at mentorship, John, and, I, and I, I've seen this a million times with you on Impact Theory and Tom about your mentor, I, uh, Mr. Brown, are you committed or are you interested? I'd love for you to talk about that. And then Dave as well. And also when mentorship comes, 
are you looking for people to tell you what you want to hear or what you need to hear? Because our ferocious Buddha, David Meltzer, ripped me when I was about to speak in front of his group. And I'm talking about like swearing at me. And like it was probably the most I've grown in the last two years because he told me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. And I grew more that day. So mentorship, number one, and then looking to mentors because I can get pretty fiery with some people, but they know that I love them at the same time. <laughs> Okay, so you, you've asked a few things on mentoring, brainathon uh, stuff. So let's, let's talk about mentoring first. So how many of you would agree that life is complex? <laughs> it's complex. Like, let's, let's not kid ourselves. I have uh, Rubik's cubes all over my, my office here. Two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, six by six, and then some octagon ones. And life is complex. And so what are some ways to make it less complex. So if I use a Rubik's cube as an example, uh, has anybody tried to solve the Rubik's cube? Three by three or four by four or two by two? Has anybody solved it on their own? Anybody solved it on their own? So one person, uh, maybe two people solved it on. Do you know why most people don't solve the Rubik's cube? It's not because it's not solvable. There's kids who do it blindfolded behind their backs in seconds. Um, most people won't take the time to learn the algorithm of where the colors need to be and what to do is the next move and the next move and the next move. So the world record for the three by three is like seconds, but to an untrained person, you might be able to try it for a hundred years and you wouldn't get it because the algorithms of what you can do uh, take an enormous amount of time and it's, it, it's really, really hard. But if you went to YouTube, and you followed a five minute video from an eight year old kid, you'd be able to solve it in a couple of minutes, eight, you know, five, six minutes. So why do I share that? Well, when you have coaches and mentors who have achieved what you want to achieve uh, or have failed as well, um, they have lessons to share with you. They have wisdom to share with you. They have blueprints to share with you. Uh, and that's why, you know, in the, in the old days, you know, um, the passing of information and knowledge from one generation to the other in tribes was so prevalent. And then we had apprenticeships, you know, and then we went to schools. And then when we get out of school, most people stop learning. They stop having mentors and coaches, you know, to walk them through some of the, uh, the basics and fundamentals. I've had mentors um, since the time I was 19. I had coaches in sports when I was younger, but mentors in business and life and health since I was 19. So 40 years I've had mentors, um, some unpaid, some I paid a lot of money to, and I still do. I still have several mentors right now for different areas of my life. And so for me, um, I, you know, I was born thinking that I was lazy. And so I wanted to do things faster and easier and what I discovered was the lazy way to do it was to learn from somebody who's already done it and made all the mistakes. So in my quest for doing it faster and easier, which I thought was lazy, was actually now I think was pretty smart because I just didn't want to fail and figure it out on my own. And so I think it's invaluable. And that's why I mean, Ricky and I and David, we, we share and we give and we, we, we mentor and coach each other. It's like having somebody lift you up as you climb and you lift others up as you climb. And so coaching and mentoring is phenomenal. If you're learning from the right people that have your values, that have achieved what you want to achieve or have made mistakes that you don't want to make. So it's invaluable in that, in that sense. And, and then on that note, uh, Ricky, you want me to talk about uh, the Brainathon this Saturday? I'll, I'll let people know. Have any of you been on my Brainathon one of the last seven or eight years? Any of you know? Have any idea what it is? So, I got fascinated with um, performance, human behavior. Why did this person succeed and this person fail? Why? Why did she achieve these results when the person next to her who learned the same stuff didn't apply it? So I'm fascinated with what causes people to take action versus other people that don't. And that took me into deep science, uh, neuroscience. I, um, I really love the, the sciences. And, um, and so many years ago when I was building Remax of Indiana, um, we got stuck at a good place. We were stuck at, uh, after five years, we were stuck at $1.2 billion in sales for the year. And um, 
uh, even though we were doing a lot of training, giving away books and back then cassette tapes and having speakers come in and some of the best trainers, motivational trainers in the world, even though we gave people what they needed, um, people wouldn't apply it. And I was like, why aren't you applying the stuff that works? And I realized that there are one of four things that held people back. And so number one is a lot of people have limiting beliefs. Uh, I'm too young or I'm too old or I'm Asian or Caucasian or white or, 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 or Chinese or whatever the case is. We have limiting beliefs and limiting beliefs are nothing more than neural networks in our brain that causes perception and behavior. Uh, number two that gets into people's way is they have a vision and goal or visions and goals that are bigger than their hidden self image. And when your vision and goal is bigger than your current self image, you will procrastinate and sabotage your success. Every time you achieve success, you'll sabotage it as a way for your brain to maintain homeostasis. And in the neuroscience field, we talk about that people will never outperform their hidden self image. And if they do better, they will sabotage too. Number three is based on all the latest neuroscience, we know there's 50 different types of fear that activate what I call as the Frankenstein brain, the fear center in the brain or the sympathetic nervous system in the brain and deactivates the Einstein part of the brain and the motivational circuit and the motor cortex. And so when we have, for example, we have a vision or goals that we want to achieve, we have a big reason why we must achieve it. When our brain projects into the future, any type of real or imagined pain or discomfort, like if I do my best and I fail, will that cause me to be judged by other people in my life? Will it cause me to be embarrassed? Will it cause me to be um, uh, ashamed or ridiculed? Will it cause me to lose money? Will it cause me to lose time? Any time that our brain senses a real or potential unpleasant experience, it deactivates the motivational center in the brain, deactivates the imagination center in the brain, except for the negative. So our Frankenstein brain is on high alert for survival and avoidance of pain before seeking to gain pleasure. And so I started to understand the mechanisms of behavior of what circuits we needed to turn on or off and what networks we wanted to work together. And there's three major networks in our brains, um, executive, uh, default, and salience networks. Now, why am I sharing this with you? Um, I have discovered that we can train our own brains. We have the most powerful biocomputer in the entire universe without a user's manual. So seven years ago, uh, I took the team uh, that was on my faculty at myneurogym.com and I said, what if we did a brainathon and let's invite, you know, 10,000 people, 5,000 people and 25,000 people showed up seven years ago. And we just did some training on, you know, uh, how to change your brain so you change your income or change your life, uh, how to unlock your brain's hidden power. And so year one, we did a brainathon for free for I think it was six hours. And then year two, we did another one for six or seven hours. Then year three, we've been doing them now for seven years. We've had as many as 155,000 people sign up for one event. One day, one event. And we do it. Um, and basically, I bring on some of the world's leading brain experts to talk about how do you let go of limiting beliefs? How do you let go of fears that are holding you back? How do you upgrade your self-image? Uh, how do you activate the neural circuits required for motivation and for you to take consistent action and not procrastinate or self-sabotage? So this year, and I've got my list over here, this year I've got Dr. Sarah Mackay, an Oxford-trained neuroscientist, mostly a neurobiologist, who's going to be showing people how to stop struggling by getting the three circuits in your brain to work together that are needed in addition to, she's going to be doing a session on how to refire your brain circuits to rewire them for higher levels of performance. Uh, that's Dr. Sarah Mackay. Dr. Dennis Waitley, some of you may recognize the legendary Dennis Waitley. He worked with Neil Armstrong, training his brain on putting his foot on the moon. Neil Armstrong, training his brain and he worked with the Apollo astronauts. He worked with the Olympic, he was the chairman of the Olympic 
psychology division. He worked with Super Bowl champions on training their brains. He's 87. It's like having it's like having Yoda of the brain and, and performance with us. So he'll be there this Saturday. Uh, I've got uh, Nierka, who's a master NLP practitioner. She's going to be focusing on limiting beliefs, fears, and self-image and how to change the identity that carries those limiting beliefs and self-image. And she is a fireball, uh, phenomenal. Maria Nemeth, Dr. Maria Nemeth, is a 74-year-old psychologist specializing in helping people shift their money mindset to make money at any age. And she earns hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars still while she's retired, basically. And then Dr. Joan Rosenberg, who teaches the PhD program at Pepperdine University in the psychology students of, uh, the graduate students of psychology, she'll be talking and teaching about emotions. Now, if you think about emotions, right? Emotions are triggered in the subconscious mind. They give rise to feelings through the neurotransmitters that they release into your bloodstream. And most people don't know how to deal with, for example, the emotion of being vulnerable, the emotion of fear, the emotion of guilt, the emotion of shame, the emotion of being embarrassed. Now, one of the things that she's taught me is that we have emotions, we are not emotions, but the average person has never been taught about emotions and what to do with them to release them and create new empowering ones that will cause you to take action instead of recede back into your safety net. So she'll, though, those are the five experts, plus I'll be doing something on turning on your brain's success switch, um, basically the motivational reward center of the brain. And uh, it's all free. We'll be starting at nine o'clock San Diego time. We'll be going to probably two, three, four o'clock on Saturday. Uh, we will have tens of thousands of people on. Uh, we'll be doing chat prizes. Ricky just gave me a couple of really good ideas uh, as well. So thank you, Ricky. Um, and that's the Brainathon. So this year it's uh, no, you know November fourteenth is the is the is the day. And if you can join, it'll be great. I I love you, man. <laughs> um, you. And just so everybody is abundantly clear, how much is it again? <laughs> it's free. All right. If you, if you pay the thousand bucks, it'll be worth it, but it's free. <laughs> hey, we'll take the thousand. I want to just take thousand. I'll take, I'll take some money. <laughs> um, everybody, whoever wants to wants an inner size book, write free in the chat. Free. R F E. The whole thing that John just mentioned is free. Your brain we, just lit up. Yeah. <laughs> and John, my phone is blowing up. The chat's blowing up. Incredible, amazing. Can't believe that. These guys are incredible. Um, John, you have literally changed the trajectory of my life. And it is something that I, I cannot express enough gratitude. The only way I know how to empower what you've done for me is to try the best I can to do it for other people. And I know Dave feels the same way. And, and Dave, if you want to close us out and just share how John has changed your life, and you know it was so cool because we were at um, an event together, and you're like, "Yeah, it's so cool." John used to be a mentor; now he's my buddy, <laughs> and that's how I feel, man. So, Dave, if you can close this out, I will stay here as long as people want to ask any questions of me that you want. But I know these guys are. I want to be super cautious of their time. Dave, close us out on mentorship and how John's changed your life. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you find people that sit in a situation that you want to be in. But you also have to manage the expectation in the relationship of mentorship because there's several different types. You know, my mother, for example, is one of the greatest mentors I've ever had. Uh, but she's also given me some of the worst advice I've ever been given. And that's because I didn't understand the context of the relationship. So I was asking her for things she wasn't capable of doing. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in mentorship is to find the people who have the skills, the knowledge, and are aligned with your desire. You know, there's one common denominator we talked about earlier I want to press upon everyone, and that's the ability to be what you must be. I look for it in all of my employees, all of my mentors. I want someone like John that doesn't want to stand before some omniscient being and say, yeah, I kind of half-assed it, right? I, I have to have the ability to must be what I can be, and my mentors have to have the same. I need to be very uh, interested in my mentors. And for that reason, one of the awarenesses is intuition. Uh, as much as you can logically say, you know, I wanted to know and learn about my relationship with money. I lost over $100 million in 2008. I met Steve Wynn, who 
I really admired for his relationship for money. I knew historically what he had done, what he had built, what energy he felt with money. I'd read about him and, you know, I just asked him, you know, would you mentor me? He said, what does that mean? I said, can I have your cell phone number? And anytime I have a quick question, I'll be very concise and respectful, but I have a difficult time with my relationship with money. I have a thermometer as John described. When I overdid my thermometer, it reset itself back to what my limiting beliefs were, even though I overachieved because of consistent, persistent discipline and behavior that I had learned, I couldn't overcome the quantum memory that I had, that, that limitation. So finding a mentor, now intuition wise, I saw John on The Secret. I lived in San Diego, I was a multimillionaire. My wife told me I was lost and I had to sit down and watch this dumb movie called The Secret. And the only part of the movies I liked was Lee Brower, who uh, I actually had done some consulting work for. He had an attitude of gratitude rock and I believed in that. And John had a vision board. And I could tell in, intuitively that he wasn't about the one scene which drove me crazy, sitting on the couch, the guy with the, the lounge chair and he's dreaming about a Ferrari. <clears throat> well, I had a kick-ass Ferrari at that time and I couldn't dream about it to have someone drive it up in my driveway. I'd worked for like 30 years to figure out how I was gonna afford a, a Ferrari. And it really bugged me. And so it was funny, I took the opportunity when I finally got to meet John and uh, learn from him and became you know, a sponge. I read everything that he had. I started looking and through that became friends and I've been blessed to uh, associate with all types of people like that. But I think people limit who they can be around. I can't tell you how many times if you put me back, although I was super successful, I ran the most notable sports agency in the world. I could be around Joe Namath, Warren Moon was my business partner, Lee Steinberg. But if I got around to John Astroff, I was nervous. And I know John experiences this like me today. So many people, and I'm, I'm gonna prove it to all 107 of you that are last or whatever. I will give out my cell phone to everyone. And this is living proof. Even though I'm teaching you about mentorship, even though I'm showing, this is how limited we separate ourselves. I do this all the time. My cell phone number, get your pen out. My cell phone number is 858-688-3294. Ricky will confirm it. John has my cell phone. That is my actual cell phone number. Even though I'm telling you that I'm here to be of service to help you. Even though I'm telling you, I, I will take the phone call, not while I'm on it. Somebody's smart enough to call me now. The miracle to me is that most people will never call. I will get one or two calls. Even though I'm telling you you're not going to call, <laughs> even though I gave you my cell phone, you will never use it. You will never use it. Because what's going to happen is you're going to look at that phone number and you're going to separate yourself from me. You're either going to see me as inferior, superior, or separate from you, and you're not going to call. To me, that's the lesson of mentorship. The lesson of mentorship is to find the people that sit in the situation that you want to be in. Find the people that are where you want to be. Ask for directions. They'll tell you how to get there. But they're not going to just offer it up. But they may. But you need to ask. And the best thing to remember is everybody's a sponsor and a power sponsor. I've learned more from people, those five-minute videos, more people than, you know, I've been in extraordinary schools. My family's hyper-academic. I learned more from sitting 10 minutes with John Astroff than an MBA. I call it an MBA in a day. If you want a, an MBA in a day, a PhD in a day, probably a, LA, a law degree in a day, go to the Brainathon because whatever you want to achieve, all it is is 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Give those hours. I promise you, it's free, by the way. You know, most Harvard, Penn, Columbia, those things are ranging about 250 grand and they take a lot longer than a few hours. You're, you are only going to get what you invest in yourself. Be more interested than interesting. Ask for help of mentors. Find people that sit in the situation you want to be in. Most importantly, remember, just because somebody loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. Uh, I appreciate everybody the opportunity, uh, and I am going to be there Saturday watching you, John, as well. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. Thank you, David. You Thank too. you, John. Thank you, Ricky. Oh, Thank wow. you, everyone. Uh, drop inner size in the chat. Drop brain appreciate in the you. chat. And I'll send you guys books. Guys, Bye, thank you so, so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. I'll stay on if anybody wants to ask me questions, but thank you.